Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here, guys. Stay with me. Shalom, Mama. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about the book by Chan Thomas called The Adam and Eve Story. Okay. You ever heard of this book? I have not. This is actually a book that covers the end of the world events by Chan Thomas. But the thing about it, there's a lot of people talking about this book because allegedly the CIA actually classified this book, mm -hmm. made it so that people couldn't actually get the chance to read what would be happening in the apocalypse. Hmm. What's, I wonder why. Well, one could imagine that they just don't want us to know what's going to happen to us. You know, the things that are coming up on the world. I mean, it's one thing for the Bible to talk about it, but this guy, Chan Thomas, was an electrical engineer. So I think it hits a little bit different when it's coming from a scientist. Right. I mean, people have a hard time interpreting what the Bible is saying, especially when they are trying to juggle between what's metaphorical and what's physical. And, you know, so a lot of stuff gets discounted that's prophesied and talked about in the Bible. But this guy was actually coming from a scientific standpoint where there would be nothing metaphorical in it at all. Mm -hmm. And so one could imagine that the governments would actually want to keep this information from you, from the public, to prevent people from going into a panic. Right. Of course, they can't do anything about it. They can't really even do anything to prepare. But if humanity really knew what was coming up on them, then they would actually turn toward the scripture, I believe. There a lot of people would turn toward the Bible and find out what it is that we are supposed to do in order to prepare for these events that are coming up on the world. And of course, our governments don't want us to do that. They want us to keep our focus on them. Right. And as if they're going to be our savior somehow. They don't want us to, they don't want humanity as a whole to recognize who our true savior is because then we'll start to abandon the government and start relying on our father for our food clothing and shelter mm -hmm. but anyway we're not really going to get into whether or not the cia actually banned the book or whether this guy chan thomas really exists and all of those other things that are covered in a lot of videos on youtube what I wanted to do when I started this study was to see if the Bible actually talks about all of these events that he's prophesying about. Well, all of these events that he's predicting, I should say, all of these things that he's saying that's going to happen. We're going to read some of it down here. And as I was going through it, I'm like, I don't remember all of this in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so what I started to do was to go in and try to find verses that confirms that what Chan Thomas said was coming is actually prophesied about in the Bible. Does the Bible really say this is going to happen? And does it say that's going to happen? And so I ended up going through all of the Bible and all of the Third Testament and some other scriptures trying to find verses that corroborate what he's saying, his story here. Right. And I was actually surprised at what I found. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to read down through here this little short story, what he calls the next cataclysm, and just compare it to some verses that we could find in the Bible. Okay. In other words, see if all he's saying is going to happen. Could it actually happen? Right. I mean, he's talking some big stuff here. So this book is not scriptural, but there are things... Um, that are said in this book that definitely lines up with scripture well that's what we're going to show it's definitely not a scriptural book like i said it's written by an engineer who from the <laughs> what i've read of it he doesn't really even believe in our father mm -hmm. at, at all he, he has the lines drawn that they try to create between uh spirituality and science but if anything he's saying is true it should we should find it in the scripture. I mean, they, that's what the Bible is all about, is telling us about what's coming and telling us what we need to do in order to prepare for the cataclysms that are coming up on the world. That's the whole Bible in a nutshell. 
basic instructions before leaving Earth. Or basic instructions before the level event, the extinction level event, which promises to annihilate at least 75% of all living creatures from our planet. But that's kind of what he's describing here. So let's go ahead and let's just read a little bit of this. Okay. With a rumble so low as to be inaudible, growing, throbbing, then fuming into a thundering roar, the earthquake starts. Only it's not like any earthquake in recorded history. So he's talking about the worst earthquake in recorded history. But check this out. When we come over to the book of Revelation in chapter 16, it is talking about or describing this earthquake as being the greatest that man has ever seen. Not just recorded history, but all of human history. Right. Go ahead and read that. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as what's not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. So this is the biggest earthquake in all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And then over in Isaiah, it's definitely seemed to be prophetic. We got a lot of verses from Isaiah. Let's look at 24 and verse 1. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattered aboard the inhabitants thereof. Alright, so this verse is talking about the severity of this earthquake when it describes the earth being emptied or turned upside down. Right. But look down at verse 19 and 20. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgressions thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. Now, these verses clearly describe the pole shift. When we hear people talk about the pole shift, they really only talk about the electromagnetic field reversal. But what's being described here, where it's talking about the earth reeling back and forth like a drunkard, is more than just the electromagnetic field, but this is actually the crust of the earth moving. This is described in the Keys of Enoch in Key 118, where it's talking about how the earth will go through an electromagnetic null in our solar system that will cause the poles to shift. You see here where it says there will be a release of 48.6 times 10 to the 15th mile tons of torque on the earth. That's what's going to shift our continent around and cause these other catastrophic events. But we're going to talk about this again when we start talking about the wind. So the first thing he says lines up, even though, you know, it's kind of limited to recorded history. But what he's saying is lining up. Mm -hmm. But that part was easy. I didn't have any trouble with that. Everybody knows about the global earthquake that's coming. So let's go on. In California, the mountains shake like ferns in a breeze. The mighty Pacific rears back and piles up into a mountain of seawater more than two miles high. Then starts its race eastward. So now here's where I really started to have problems. A mountain of seawater two miles high. This is talking about a tsunami. Yeah, that's pretty high. But the water being two miles, you know. And so I got to thinking, OK, so where does the scripture talk about a tsunami? Where is the tsunami at in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And that's what really had me starting to have doubts about what this Chan Thomas was saying because I, I just didn't remember it. But then Luke chapter 21 and 25 came to mind. I actually found this verse that actually talks about it. Okay. Would you go ahead and read that? And there should be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So here it is talking about waves right? as part of this cataclysm that's coming up on the world. We have these roaring waves to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then when we come over to the third testament of the Bible, like down here in chapter 55, it's talking about how the water will cleanse the earth. Matter of fact, would you go ahead and read verse 15? The earth will tremble. Water will cleanse and fire will purify humanity. 
All the elements and forces of nature will make themselves felt throughout the world where human beings have not known how to live in harmony with the life which surrounds them. So there is talking about water along with fire and even an earthquake mm-hmm. that's going to cleanse or purify humanity. Right. Mm-hmm. So this is what Chan is talking about when he's talking about a two bow high tsunami. So is there any significance to um, him stating that about California and then moving eastward? Well, I haven't read the whole book yet. But I'm sure he will go into more detail in the book. But I give a link to the book down in the description if anybody wants to check out and see why it is that he's talking about California. I personally believe that he's where he lives or something like that. But let's let's go on. Read some of the other stuff he says. With the force of a thousand armies, the wind attacks, ripping, shredding everything in a supersonic bombardment. The unbelievable mountain of Pacific seawater follows the wind eastward, bearing Los Angeles and San Francisco as if they were but grains of sand. All right. Now, notice right here that he starts talking about the wind. Right. But you see where he says supersonic bombardment? Yeah, that's a strange word to um, have when you're describing the actions of the wind. Yeah. Yeah. The only time you would experience wind like that is if you were on a jet plane or on a jet car traveling Mm -hmm. faster than the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. So this wind would be at over 700 miles per hour. And and this is what I had the most trouble with. This wind, this supersonic wind. Mm -hmm. But when I went in and started looking through the scripture, I found verse after verse that talks about this wind like Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in my anger, and great hailstorms, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. And Jeremiah chapter four. At that time shall it be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the high places in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan, not to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. Now also will I give sentence against them. 22 and 22. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shall thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. So this is all relating to, um, is this relating to how the most high uses wind or is this all relating to the end times? No, these are about prophecies related to the wind. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of this wind is not described anywhere else in the Bible. Right. All right. So remember, we were talking about the keys of Enoch, where it was talking about these 48 times 10 to the 15 ton miles of torque on the earth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to actually spin the earth. We see down here, it says placing catastrophic stress on the shell of the earth and spinning the mantle of the earth. Well, this shifting of the crust will not only cause the earthquake that we've been talking about, but it could actually cause this wind, this supersonic wind, if the crust is actually rotating or spinning around the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. This, I believe, is actually prophesied in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 12, where it's talking about how the sun and the moon would be absent for one third of the day. Well, you think about how that happens. How does the sun go away eight hours faster or the nighttime go away eight hours faster? Well, that's actually the earth spinning. Mm hmm. That's the reason why we have daylight and nighttime is because of the rotation of the earth. Well, according to what we see here in Revelation chapter 8, it's actually going to speed up as the earth shifts about 120 degrees. Well, that 120 degree shift would cause that supersonic wind. Right. So that would be um, what the keys of Enoch referred to as... Um, spinning on the mantle. Exactly. What's going on is the core of the earth is going in one direction 
at a rate so fast that the crust can't keep up. Mm -hmm. And so the crust experiences an earthquake, but it also has to shift just a little bit to try to catch up to the core, causing the biggest earthquake that any human has ever seen and causing this supersonic wind. Well, let's go on. Okay. Nothing but nothing stops the relentless, overwhelming onslaught of wind and ocean. So we have this to look forward to. Across the continent, the thousand mile per hour wind wrecks its hell, its unholy vengeance everywhere, mercilessly, unceasingly. Every living thing is ripped into shreds while being blown across the countryside, and earthquakes leave no place untouched. In many places, the earth molten sublayer breaks through and spreads a sea of white hot liquid fire to add to the Holocaust. Within three hours, the fantastic wall of seawater moves across the continent, bearing the wind, ravaged land under two miles of seeping water coast to coast. That reminds me of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15. Okay, that says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So this is what the engineers calculate mm -hmm. that will happen. That this flood caused by the shifting of the core will bury the continents under two miles of water coast to coast. Mm -hmm. This is what they, like I said, this is what they calculate. Two miles high. Right. They are saying that the waters will be two miles high. But when we read a little bit further in Revelations, look what it says in verse 16. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So here we see what will actually happen. Mm -hmm. You have the scientists predicting one thing just based on mathematical models and all of that, but they don't take into account what our father's plan is. And that is that the earth will open up and swallow up some of this water. Right. Mm -hmm. Remember humanity has to go on. If it wasn't for our father's provisions for his protection, during this time, all of humanity would go extinct. But then notice that it's talking about this white hot liquid fire. Is that the molten from the volcanoes? Well, we saw back in verse 15 of chapter 53 that the fire is going to purify humanity. Right. It says something similar down in chapter 56 and verse 62. Would you read that? The flood that cleansed the earth of the human impurities and the fire that descended upon Sodom, you know them as legends. However, in this era, you will also contemplate how humanity will be touched as the earth trembles by the force of the air, the water, and the fire. However, I shall again send you an ark, which is my law, so that those who penetrate in it may be saved. So we see what happens to the floodwaters and now we see how it is that we're supposed to escape the fire and the wind and the earthquakes. And that is by his law. And by this ark, which is his law. And just for fun, let's read verse 63. Not all of those who on that hour of trial will say, Father, Father, will love me, but rather those who always practice my love for their fellow men those shall be saved. So here he's talking about the law and he's talking about love for our fellow man. This is what the Messiah was talking about when he said to love our father with all of our heart. That would be referring to the law. And then he goes on to say to love our neighbor as ourself. Right. That is the ark by which we are to be saved from the earth when the fire and the water that is coming up on us as part of this apocalypse. Mm -hmm. But let's go on and see what else Chan Thomas has to say. In a fraction of a day, all vestiges of civilization are gone and the great cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, California, Dallas, New York, Boston, are nothing but legends. Barely a stone is left where millions walked just a few hours ago. It reminds me of Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 20, where it says that every wall on the planet will fall. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, would you read that? So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence 
and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the sea places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And then, of course, it says that they will be buried under water, so mm -hmm. these cities and towns will be gone. Sort of like what um, we picture as, I don't know if it's true or if it's a legend, Atlantis, the city that is underneath the water. Well, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's hard to tell if it was actually named Atlantis or not, but every time we have this shift in our core like this, the earth is rearranged. This is what the scripture refers to as we'll have a new earth, uh, it's just going to be in a different shape. The globe won't make sense anymore as the continents that we recognize now will be gone away. The third testament in chapter 55 talks about this in verse 69. Three quarters of the surface of the earth shall disappear and one quarter only shall remain as a refuge for those that survive the chaos. You shall see the fulfillment of many prophecies. So this is talking about continents going underwater. Mm -hmm. But let's back up to verse 59. There will be regions which will be buried under the waters and new lands will appear. So this is talking about new continents coming up out of the water mm -hmm. and some of them being buried. So some cities will go away. And then we'll have new lands that will appear. This is what, like I said, is talking about the new earth. Right. Our planet will become new again. And you could, so you have all of the walls fall. You have all of the mountains being leveled, all of the islands being shifted out of their places. Then you have this wind, supersonic wind that will push everything else away that is not burned in this molten lava. Mm -hmm. This is what the scripture is referring to when it says that everything will be made equal. Mm -hmm. We will all be forced back to this primitive state again where we'll all start from the beginning. There will be no houses, no money, no cars. Everything people use for their security now will be gone, destroyed in one way or another. And then we're all going to have to rebuild starting from the beginning. Yeah, it's sort of like... Um the Most High is um, using what's naturally going to occur, um, you know, by way of him. Um, but he's using the elements to humble us. And like you always said, um, you can't be humbled without humiliation. And I guess that's just a way of us being humiliated in order to become humble. Well, we have to be careful not to blame him for any of this at all. He's oh, yeah. not the author of this. He's right. actually the one only telling us about it. Right. And we have to understand that this is something that naturally, like you said, occurs here on our planet. Periodically occurs. We have this shift in our um our pose every so often that rearranges our earth. It just happens, you know, so many millions of years or so many hundreds of thousands of years apart. The thing about it, this time humans are here. Right. You know, we've been here for about 6,000 years and this time it promises to destroy everything on the planet. All humans will either die during the initial wave, during the initial earthquake or if they survive that, then they have this water two miles high to deal with, this wind traveling at supersonic speeds to deal with, and this fire that is white hot to deal with promises to destroy every human on the planet. But our father's role in all of this is to actually preserve a seed, to actually save some of humanity. Some people will be saved, just like the days of Noah, where you had a similar event there were eight people out of everybody on a planet that survived. Eight people survived out of millions, if not billions, that lived at the time. Um, the other billions of people were wiped away in the flood. Well, that's the exact case that's going to be that's going to happen this time where you're going to have billions of people who are going to be subject to these elements rising up. But our father chooses to save a few of them out of it. It's going to be, praise our Father in heaven, a lot more than eight this time, but only a few people will actually survive what's coming up on the world. So can we say that it's a natural occurrence 
when it's actually the father who's actually orchestrating this? He's not orchestrating. That's why I, that's why I keep trying to tell you not to say that he is not doing it. This is the way it just happens with the earth. This is but this but this is his earth, right? This is his earth, sure. Mm -hmm. But that don't mean that he's sitting back throwing hailstones at us and grabbing it by the handles and shaking it. It's just the way things happen. Right. He is not causing this. He's actually telling us what's coming up on the world so that we can be prepared for it. A lot of ministers, that's actually considered blasphemy mm -hmm. when you say that he's the one who's doing this. He's the one who's causing this and he's the one who's causing If anybody is doing this, it's humans that's doing it because of our rebellion. We are disrupting natural law. And anytime we do something that's against the law, we send negativity out into the universe that is then multiplied and has to come back up on us in multiples. Every time we steal, every time we lie, every time we have a negative thought, every time we do something uh, wrong. That's actually an energy that's put out into the universe that must be re multiply it must be multiplied and then it must come back up on us for a force well you have all of these people in the world now that's committing adultery that's breaking the laws into bestiality all kinds of stuff people murder child uh, people just doing anything and everything they want to do seemingly in peace they're right. getting away with it you know they, they, all you have to do is have enough money to buy a good lawyer and you can just about get away with anything in this world right now and live happily ever after well no all of that negative energy has to come back up on the world so we are causing these events because they're going to come back at one time to annihilate every wicked seed that's on the earth only leaving behind those who are willing to actually do right from now on Right. We are actually the ones that's causing this. And so and that's important to understand so we can stop being blasphemous saying that it's our father that's doing this. That's 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 not right at all. He is just the one who is is telling us. Now I understand that we can get confused reading the Old Testament, especially the King James Version of the Bible, that says that our Lord did this and Lord did that, confusing us because we don't recognize Lord as being different than God. We see Lord and God as the same being. And so when it talks about Lord uh, uh, killing these people back there in Egypt or the Lord will do this or the Lord will do even some of these verses that we read here, the Lord will do this and the Lord will do that. That is not our father that is talking about. That's talking about these other Elohim who include um, nature. It includes the angels. It includes the death angel. It includes all of these other entities that are not so peaceful. That are not that 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 are not so polite. That are not so friendly as our father is. And so we have to separate him out of that, recognizing that he is our father and he only intends for our good. But the thing about it, he gave us his word and his scripture so that we can understand what his good is and how it is that we are to survive. But if we go on to reject his scripture and continue to break these laws of nature, well, then we're bringing this stuff on ourselves. I was wondering, you know, why is it that the father uses um, the elements um, to do things? But I also was thinking that if he used, you know, any other thing, man could probably stop it, you know, or uh, the tanks, man could stop that, but man can't stop fire, man can't stop water, neither can it stop the wind. <laughs> yeah, well, think, think of it, think of it this way. I don't use that hot stove over there to teach my child not to touch it. The stove is hot anyway. Right. What I do is I tell him not to touch it. It's not me that's going to burn him. The stove is already hot anyway. And so what I do is I choose to put a lesson in that, a lesson of obedience. When I look at that three-year-old child, a two-year-old child, and I say, don't touch that stove, it's going to burn you. Mm -hmm. Now, if that child goes up and puts his hand on that stove, he doesn't have any right to look back at me and say that I burnt him. Right. It wasn't me. All I did was I taught him a lesson in obedience. You do what I say or you're going to get burnt. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, that's the same way our father is. He's not using the elements. He's not creating the disturbances in our elements, but he's actually putting a lesson in that. You obey what these laws are. You obey what these scriptures are, or these elements are going to do are going to harm you. So what you're saying is the elements already have, well, the stove is already hot. Mm -hmm. The elements already have this natural force behind them. Um, the father just uses them to teach us a lesson. This happens periodically. Pangea, all of these other, the, the, apparently the continents have shifted around several times. We, we have several um, um, times when the earth has gone through this and it shifted our continents around. This happens periodically. Well, it's getting ready to happen again. Only our father knows the exact day and hour that it's actually going to happen. But what he's saying is, okay, if you want to survive this, you will obey these laws. That's what these laws are for. These are instructions that we're given before this event happens. If we obey those instructions, then we'll survive. If we don't obey those instructions, then those elements are going to annihilate us. They're going to destroy us off the planet. So he's not causing the pain. Just like I'm not causing that pain that's coming from that stove when he puts his hand on it. But he is putting a lesson in it saying, do this or you're going to get burnt. And then at the end of the day, whether we put our hands on the fire, whether we put our hands on the stove or not, whether we choose to obey, like there are those now who are studying the law and learning how to live um, with this neighborly love and loving our father. Love, they, they are doing that now, getting in the ark now. There are those who are going to wait and actually put their hands on the stove, meaning they're going to wait until the global earthquake comes and this supersonic wind and this molten lava and these two mile high waves come. They, too, will actually learn after it's over with to obey the law. If they survive, they will have to learn to live within the law for their survival. So whether we touch the hot stove or not, we're going to get this lesson out of it. Whether we choose to obey or choose to not obey. Either way, the lesson is going to be learned. We're going to get it. Okay, so I have one more question. And I ask this um, mainly, this next, last question, mainly so that, you know, if anybody have any um, questions about it, you know, we always say that I ask questions. Um, and I do so a lot of times so other people can be edified. And so that I can get a clear understanding of what as well. So we have this example we're using of this hot stove, but it's up to you as the owner of this hot stove. If you decide to leave that hot stove there or if you decide to take that hot stove out. Yeah. And so if I decide to take it out, everybody's going to be cold. So the thing about it, everybody else is going to suffer because I got one disobedient little two year old child that refuses to do what I tell him to do. So now I have to let the fire go out or I have to remove the stove altogether for his sake. Now everybody's going to suffer. And that's the case with this. This is a natural occurrence. This is something that has to happen to our earth. It has to go on. The thing about it. Those who are obedient and doing what they have to do, there is just going to be a bump in the road for them. For the people that survive, this is actually going to be the best thing that ever happened to them. This is how we end up inheriting the earth. Mm -hmm. This is how all of our oppressive government systems go away. This is how all the rebellious people in the world go away. People who now prefer unrighteousness and prefer wickedness and are able to have their way over the rest of us, you know, dominating us, coming in, forcing their idolatry upon us. All of that is going away. And we ain't going to have to worry about that again as we fall back into this new cycle of husbandry as described over here in the Keys of Enoch when it was talking about this uh, ton miles of torque being applied to the earth. Well, what this is going to cause is the playing field to be made level. You're not going to have anybody exalted anymore, at least for a while. There may be some that rise up, you know, dozens of years or hundreds of years later. But we're all going to have to start from scratch as the earth has been rearranged 
all the mountains flattened, all the valleys raised high, all of the walls fell down, all of the roads gone away, Walmart trucks gone, ain't nobody gonna be able to call 911 no more. Everything is gonna be made equal. We're all gonna be equal and it's just a matter of getting back to the way we're supposed to do things and that's in husbandry. Right. That's actually tending to crops and tend growing our own food and building our own houses and doing all of that. The people who now survive off the luxury of being able to make a phone call and pay somebody to come and do that and pay somebody to come and do this. All of those days are going away. So it's actually a benefit in the end. Of course, it's a little bit trouble to get there, but a lot of people are looking forward to this day. Of course, we're told not to because right. it's going to be a very treacherous or hard time as we get through this hump. It's going to be a really bad experience as we go through this transition. But what they're really looking forward to is on the other side of this transition. Right. There be no wickedness. I mean, you think of how many people are benefiting from wickedness now. Mm -hmm. All of that's going away. And so the thing about it, that hot stove. Even though it may be a little bit dangerous, especially for those who are disobedient, is actually a benefit for everybody else, especially those that are obedient. Right. And so that's what's going to be the true test. Are you obedient or are you not? If you're not, you're going to get burned. If you are, then you're going to find that that hot stove is going to be one of the best things you have in your house. Yeah, I think I was reading in the um, Great Book of Life the other day where it says when someone tries to raise their um, raise wickedness up that the righteous because there will be so many will definitely cancel that out quickly yeah I mean now you, you have good people who are silent in the face of wickedness well after we go through this event there's, there's not going to be the case anymore I mean people come in and talking about we want to go serve other gods this and do serve other gods that whereas now you know the righteous try to be quiet and try to be humble well then you know they're actually going to be hitting people with rocks they're not going to stand for it sort of like going back to the days of um what we call the Old Testament. The Old Testament days are not going to stand for it because they know the end result. We didn't see what happens when we allow wickedness to prevail. And it's not going to happen. They're not going to be willing to do that anymore. But anyway, let's see if we can finish up there over here with Chan Thomas. A few lucky ones who managed to find shelter from the screaming wind on the lee side of a high mountain peak, such as Mount Massive, watched to see a molten fire breaking through the quaking valleys below. The raging waters follow at supersonic speeds, piling higher and higher, streaming over the molten earth fire and rising almost to their feet. Only great high mountains such as this one can withstand the cataclysm onslaught. So, see if so now here I still have a problem with this because we learned that all of the mountains will be made low. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that there will be those who will be taking shelter on the other side of the mountain. Well, there's not going to be any mountain for them to take shelter in. Right. You know, and we're not told that in the scripture to, you know, find, you know, a mountain to hide behind. Right. So this could actually be leading people astray as, you know, they sell their houses and try to move to, the, you know, some eastern side of some mountain in California thinking it's going to help them. So is this a... Um this description that he's giving, is this just a description of what he um, believes that's going to happen? Or is this a dream that he's had? No, this is actually calculations. He's 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 not the originator of this. I forget the, the names of the books that he's uh, referring to. There's some other um, authors who talk about these events too, other engineers, other scientists who um, made similar predictions and his kind of parallels those is, is just based on um, uh, history, just based on science, just makes, based on mathematical models is what these guys, like I said, there's several of them who predict these events this is what's going to actually happen. This is what they've come up with in their minds. And having read it myself, I wanted to see if any of this is actually prophesied in the scripture. Right. And some of it is. 
which we've already talked about, the earth, the wind, the fire, and the water are all prophesied in the scripture. And some of it ain't where it's talking about people hiding behind these mountains. We don't hear about that in scripture, at least far as I know. If anybody um, does know of a scripture that says we're supposed to hide behind a mountain, you can put it down there in the comment section. And what, what about that scripture that tells us to um, go to the mountains? Does that have, I don't know if that's an end time prophecy scripture or if that's uh, a scripture to do with something else. This is actually a scripture to do with something else okay. as is talking about the prophecy given to Daniel. All right. And when you have the abomination of desolation, which turns out to be the dome of the rock, what they were told is when they see this dome of the rock being placed on the temple mount to actually flee Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And they did when they saw this event happen back there in about 685 AD, all of the Israelites left Israel. They all fled out of Jerusalem and they, some of them fled into the mountains. And of course, some of them continued westward until they ended up on a slave ship coming over here to America. But this is why you have no Israelites in Jerusalem. Now, this is why it's being trodden down by the Gentiles, because they obeyed that command to flee when they saw the Dome of the Rock being placed. Okay. Well, one other thing that I wanted to talk about when it's talking about this screaming wind, like we said, as far as I know, there's no scripture that says that we can hide behind a high mountain peak. But we do have the example of our Messiah who taught us that we have the ability to control the wind. We could stop the wind. We can rebuke the wind. We could tell the wind to stop blowing mm -hmm. and we can actually make that happen. Mm -hmm. He was the example of that. And we learn how to do so. We learn how it's done in the third testament of the Bible. We actually did a video on it called controlling the elements or something like that. We do have now we have or at least the disciples do. Those who have faith have the ability to control this wind. And so that's one of the things we'll do when we see this wind come up on us. One of the first things we're going to start doing is praying against this wind. Mm -hmm. and maybe the water too. We won't be able to stop the earthquake because it's going to come up on us too fast. By the time we realize that the earthquake is happening, the great earthquake is happening, it's pretty much going to be all up on us. It's just going to be so sudden of an event. But once we see this wind start blowing, we'll have the opportunity to pray against it well, we see this water star rising, we may have the opportunity to pray against it. And that's going to be part of how we are to be saved in all of this. That's what he means by those who call upon the name of the Lord. Well, those who start praying in the name of our master, they will be the ones who will actually be able to stop some of these elements from destroying them. Got to remember, it's all about the scripture. And these instructions that were given to us before this event happens, the basic instructions before the level event ever kicks off, we were actually told what it is we're supposed to be doing. But let's go on. North America is not alone in her death throes. Central America suffers the same cannonade. Wind, earth, fire, and inundation. So this is actually a worldwide event. Every corner of the earth will suffer through this earthquake. Like the like it said in the scripture, every wall will fall. Every mountain will make, be made low. This is talking about the entire planet. Mm -hmm. South America finds the Andes not high enough to stop the cataclysmic violence pounded out by nature in her berserk rage. In less than a day, Escavador, Peru, and Western Brazil are shaken madly by the devastating earthquake. The Andes are piled higher and higher by the Pacific supersonic onslaught as it surges over itself against the mountains. The entire continent is burned by molten earth fire, buried under cubic miles of catastrophic violent seas, then turned into a frozen hell. Everything freezes, man, beast, plant, and mud or all rock hard in less than four hours. Now, here I haven't found any scripture on where we're actually supposed to get frozen, where this is actually supposed to cause all of this freezing. 
And like I said, this is why I'm doing this video is because I wanted to see if, you know, what he's saying in here was prophesied about in the scripture. And I don't see anything that talks about this cold. So, or, so he's just coming from it from a scientific view. Yeah, absolutely. This is, like I said, based on mathematical models. This is what's actually supposed to happen. The only thing is we have our father that's intervening on our behalf. And then we have his survivors, his disciples who know how to pray, know what to pray for, actually intervening on our behalf, too. Mm -hmm. And preventing a lot of this stuff. This is why we have to understand this pole shift coming on the world is because we can pray against a lot of these events. We can stop many of these events simply through prayer. Like I said, the only reason why I believe we can't stop the earthquake is because we don't know when it's going to happen. If we remember back over in the book of Revelations, these people were getting ready for a Christmas party when the earthquake happens. Mm -hmm. So everybody's making merry and having fun and doing their own thing. And then all of a sudden we start to get this rumble thinking that it's just a normal earthquake. But when we wake up at the next morning, we find out that every building on the planet has been destroyed. Right. Well, then, you know, at some point we have this wind and stuff to deal with afterwards. And that's when all of the praying starts. So from a scientific view, do you see why he says that the earth will freeze? Everything will freeze? Well, because one is the sun is supposed to shine in one part of the world, leaving the other part without sunlight. I think he goes on to talk about that, how the, um, the one side of the earth will be getting cooked while the other side of the planet will be getting frozen. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, all of the debris that's kicked up into the atmosphere that could be blocking out the sun and all it is. But I don't really understand how he's, you know, saying that it's going to happen so quickly. We just yeah. don't have any scripture in, in it on that. Yeah. But if anybody else knows about it, let's put it in the comment section and we can address it later. But let's go on. Europe cannot escape the onslaught. The raging Atlantic piles higher and higher on itself, following the screeching wind eastward. The Alps, Pyrenees, Urals, and Scandinavian mountains are shaken, then heaved even higher than the wall of seawater strike. And see, this is where I'm going to say that he's wrong, because he's talking about these mountains getting higher and higher. Mm -hmm. That's not what the scripture says. It says that every mountain and hill will be made low. Right. So, you know, like I said, he got some things right. But then some things he's getting wrong, thinking that there's there's going to be still mountains left. No, all of the mountains are going away. All of the valleys are going away. The earth will be made flat and plain again, according to what we read in the scripture, or at least changed around. Mm -hmm. So he can't really say that the Andes Mountains is going to get higher. I mean, based on his mathematical models, he may be predicting that, but it's not scriptural. Well, well, if the mountains are higher, that means that, you know, like he said, the lucky ones will have a place to escape. Yeah, he probably lives in the mountains. And that's what a lot of these people do is they figure out how they and their families is going to survive. They get to talk to their wives and their wives start showing fear. And they say, you know, well, we're going to be all right because we live here and we live there. You know what I mean? So that's what a lot of them do. Either we're going to be out or we're going to move to some place where we're going to be safe. And so they'll move to these mountains that are going to be high enough to uh, escape this. That's what all of them do. Mm -hmm. They when you When they talk, their area is the one area that's going to survive. That's the way all of them that's, that's talking about this believe when you ask them, OK, well, you know, is your area going to be underwater or covered? They'll give you some reason why their area is going to be safe, why they why they're going to live and everybody yeah. else is going to die. They're the good ones and everybody else is the bad ones. Yeah, yeah they do that every time. Well, we have to go on scripture. No, there is no mountains that's going to survive this. Those who listen to these guys and move to the mountains. You know, they're, they're, they're putting their faith in man. They're putting their faith in the false prophet. That's actually going to lead them astray and lead them to their own destruction. There's only one way out of this, and that's to call upon the name of our father. You know, that's, that's it. Love for our father and love for our neighbor. That's the art. That's the only way we can get through this. We can't do anything else. There is nothing else. 
Anything else is going to give us a false sense of security mm-hmm. that's going to thrust us into the spirit world before it's over with. But anyway, let's go on. Western Africa and the sands of the Sahara vanished in nature's wrath under savage attack by wind and ocean. The area bounded by Zaire, South Africa, and Kenya suffers only severe earthquakes and winds, little inundation. Survivors there marvel at the sun, standing still in the sky for nearly half a day. No, and so this right here is not really scriptural at all. We're talking about the sun standing still in the sky for half a day. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand where he's getting this from. We have the example over there in Joshua where the sun stood still in the sky. Mm -hmm. That actually happened. But when you think about it, for the sun to stand still in the sky, which that means that the Earth's rotation would have to stop. The, the, all of a sudden, the Earth stopped spinning mm-hmm. for a period of time. This mm-hmm. has happened twice in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Well, this time, the opposite is actually prophesied. Not that the Earth is going to stop spinning like it did back there in the days of Joshua, mm-hmm. but it's actually going to spin a lot faster right. this time. It's going to be the opposite effect where we're going to have this jerk in motion where it seems like the earth is going to accelerate 120 degrees faster over the course of eight hours, at least 120 degrees faster from a northeast standpoint. Mm-hmm. That doesn't take into consideration if we're going to move in, be moving in the southwest direction at all so it could be more than 120 degrees but at least 120 degrees of the earth rotation the earth's rotation will accelerate over the course of this 24 hours and like i said that's what's going to cause these buildings and the walls and everything to these tsunamis and these Mm -hmm. uh, volcanoes and all of this stuff to become unleashed on us but let's go on Eastern Siberia and the Orient suffers a strange late indeed, as though a giant subterranean site sweeps away the Earth's foundation, accompanied by the wind and a screaming symphony of supersonic death and destruction. As the Arctic basin leaves its polar home, Eastern Siberia, Manchuria, China, and Burma are subjected to the same annihilation as South America. Wind, earth fire, inundation, and freezing, jungle animals are shredded to ribbons by the wind, piled into mountains of flesh and bone, and buried under avalanches of harmonized seawater and mud. Then comes a sudden, seemingly infinite supply of terrible, instantly paralyzing temperature drop of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Not man, beast, plant, mud, water, nor water is left unfrozen in the entire Eastern Asian continent, most of which remains below sea level. So here he's talking about this freezing again. Right. Which we don't hear anything about freezing in the Bible. Right. You see, there's nothing about cold being prophesied about in the book of Revelation or pretty much anywhere else do we hear about any prophecies related to freezing or being cold during this time. Not saying that it ain't going to happen, But like I said, the purpose of this video is to come in and see if all of these stuff that he's talking about has a scriptural reference. Can we find it in the scripture? If I can't find it in the scripture, I don't really believe it, but it could happen. You know, it's just we're not being asked to prepare for it. You know, we're asked to prepare for the earthquake simply by telling us that it's coming. We're asked or told how to prepare for the wind because we're told how to stop the wind. We have control over the wind. We're told that the earth is going to stop the uh, flood from taking us over. By opening up. By opening up. And then we got that fire to deal with, that liquid fire to deal with. But, you know, we don't really have frost in the scripture. We're not really told anything about that. Right. So anyway, let's go on. Antarctica... And Greenland, with their ice caps, now rotate around the Earth in the torrid zone. And the fury of wind and inundations marches on for six days. During the sixth day, the oceans start to settle in their new homes, running off the high grounds. So here's what will be part of his mathematical model here, where he's getting these six days. Mm -hmm. But we're not told about these six days happening. Mm -hmm. However, you know, with Antarctica and Greenland actually moving and changing... 
And we are told about that when we hear about, you know, the 120 degree shift and how we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. This is actually continents being moved around this so-called torrid zone. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go on. On the seventh day, the horrendous rampage is over. The Arctic Ice Age is ended and a new Stone Age begins. The oceans, the great homogenizers, have laid down another deep layer of mud over the existing strata in the Great Plains as exposed in the Grand Canyon, Painted Desert, Monument Valley, and the Badlands. So, in other words, the Arctics now would actually be moved and will no longer be by the poles. Mm -hmm. So all of that ice up there will start to melt. Right. And all of these valleys here will be filled in with mud. Mm -hmm. This is how the valleys go away, is that they're filled in with mud. And a lot of the mountaintops will be pushed over into these valleys, making the earth plain, making the earth equal for us again. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine as people emerge, there will be some survivors. They will have this new earth to deal with, basically learning how to rebuild that's why a lot of people are learning how to reconstruct old houses now. They will be finding some of this old wood floating around and, you know, be able to rebuild them someplace to get in right. as life as we start over. Mm -hmm. Humanity will have to start from pretty much the beginning. We'll have the know-how. We'll know how a house is supposed to look, but we're going to have to find the tools in the wood to actually build these houses. That's what the tents are for. But anyway, let's go on. The Bay of Bengal Basin, just east of India, is now at the North Pole. The Pacific Ocean, just west of Peru, is at the South Pole. Greenland and Antarctica, now rotating equilaterally, bind their ice caps dissolving madly in the tropical heat. Massive walls of water and ice surge toward the oceans, taking everything from mountains to plains, in gushing, heavy paths, while creating immense seasonal moraines. In less than 25 years, the ice caps are gone and the oceans around the world rise over 200 feet with the newfound water. The torrid zone will be shrouded in a fog for generations from the enormous amounts of moisture poured into the atmosphere by the melting ice caps. Yeah, so we have these ice caps to deal with as they start to melt. And the ice caps themselves are made of rainwater. It's not really ocean water, it's rainwater. And so as the old ones are melting away, we will have new ones, praise our Father in heaven, that will be being created as it rains, you know, up there where the new North Pole would be. What does it say here? He says India will be in the new North Pole. So as it rains in the new North Pole, new ice caps will be created. But will they be created fast enough to where we won't see, you know, the sea levels rise too high? Only our father knows. But by then, that's going to be a much slower deal. I mean, it's not like it's going to happen overnight. And so we'll, you know, keep track of the rising waters over the course of the years. And, you know, we'll be able to push our house further, you know, away as we see the waters start to rise. You know, as I'm reading this here, it sort of reminds me of that movie. Uh, it was a cartoon. Uh, you always refer to it um, with the old grandma and the cave people. Yeah, the Krugs or something like that. Yeah, uh, I'm just having a picture of of cave people. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where we're going, at least for a little while. Like I said, every building will be destroyed, you know, and so we'll... People will be surviving in caves or under rocks or wherever we can get to. As like we said, we have to start to rebuild the planet. Yeah, well, you have, you know you have a lot of people who's listening to this and just saying, "I think I'd rather just go into the spiritual world." Well, and they've been planning on that for a <laughs> while. That's what they call the rapture. You know that e this event that you know will annihilate. The majority of the people will perish off of the, the planet at this time. People are actually counting on this mm -hmm. because they don't want to live in this area that's going to be humiliated. An era away from it, uh, materialism. Their houses are gone. Their cars are gone. Their televisions are gone. Their cell phones are gone. They'd rather be gone too. They don't want to be. <laughs> they don't want to be here. 
They don't want to live through this. They don't want to. They they'd rather go off into the spirit world, wait for the survivors to get it straightened out, and then come back. <laughs> You know, and you know, spirit, don't worry about it. Spirit world don't sound so bad now. That it now. don't sound so bad until you realize what actually goes on in the spirit world. Right. Like, <laughs> like we read over here in Second Ezra, chapter thirteen, re referring to the situation, and it says, "Better are those who are left behind. Better are those who are left alive than those who have died." Mm -hmm. So. Sure, they may be thinking that they will be better off in the spirit world and not having to deal with this um, this new earth, this and, you know, this husbandry and having to get out there and fend for ourselves, you know, and all of this kind of stuff that will be going on. But they're not considering what's actually going to happen to them. Right. The third testament of the Bible goes on to talk about those that will actually be taken away. It will be those who are in rejection of the law, rejection, those who hate the, the scripture, those who hate, you know, doing what the Bible actually says and those that are selfish towards their brother. Those will be the ones that will be removed during this time mm -hmm. and they will spend a time in hell, a, a place of purification where they have the uh, fire of their conscience burning on their spirit, reminding them of, you know, how greedy and how disobedient they prefer to be down here on the planet. They will have that to deal with at least for a number of years as the people on the earth, you know, start to get things straightened back up or they may have to stay there for a thousand years, the lake of fire. So sure, they might be thinking that, you know, being removed is better off, but it's because they ain't. They ain't reading the scripture on what actually happens to them. They will be better off surviving this. Well, they're not they're not reading the third testament. Um because, you know, if just by listening to what, you know, the church tells us and what we're we're being taught, um, we're just gonna be chilling up there with the Messiah and sitting down here sitting up there watching all the bad stuff happen to those bad people that are left here to uh, in for themselves. Yeah, you better read uh, Second Ezra chapter thirteen, you know, and and find out that you know if you don't decide to repent down here and have love for your brother down here, you will be purified after you die. You will go through pain. Then you, it's as hell. You're gonna instead of you know them teaching you that you're gonna be going to heaven, they should be teaching you that you're gonna be going to hell. Though all of those who are removed from this planet during this event will be in hell. They will be in that tor place of torment. It's just a, just a matter of how long will they be there. Prayfully, they won't be there, you know, that long. But there's many who will be there for at least a thousand years missing the kingdom of heaven because they preferred unrighteousness. They preferred to listen to the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug, who told them that they can be just as disobedient as they want to, and they can be just as selfish as they want to, and they don't have to worry about anything. Well, turns out they're going to be worse off than anybody who actually survives these events that's coming on. You'd rather deal with the thousand miles per hour wind or the white hot lava or the two mile high waves or this global earthquake is you're going to be better off being alive than if you were to actually have to go into the spirit world. But anyway, let's go on. Greenland and Antarctica emerge with verdant tropical foliage. Australia is a new unexplored continent in the north temperate zone. With only a few handfuls of survivors populating its vastness, New York lies at the bottom of the Atlantic, shattered melted by earth fire and covered by unbelievable amounts of mud. Of San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, and Boston, not a trace is left. They all would join the legends of the seven cities of Kabola. Now, even before I heard about this book or read anything out of it, I was looking at how our magnetic field is traveling towards Siberia. And I'm thinking, okay, if the geo pole if the geographical pole follows that would put siberia as or somewhere like that as the new north pole and places like america will actually be in the tropics mm. 
It would actually put us in a tribe. And maybe, you know, like we were talking earlier, everybody wants to think that their home is what's going to be safe. But, you know, when I was looking at that, the, from the parallel that we're on, we could very well end up subtropical, if not on the equator ourselves. Yeah. So things would get really hot around here. Yeah, you and Christian was talking about that uh, maybe a month ago, even like you said, even before you even, I think, knew about this book. Yeah, but they're prophesying that there's going to be a 90 degree shift. Mm -hmm. So everything that's on the equator now is going to the poles and everything that's on the poles is going to the equator or something mm -hmm. like that. Either way, we're going to have new vegetation and stuff that's going to be popping up. There's going to be a shift somehow. And so we're going to be in a different part of the world. And so people will try to be remembering how to build sundials so they can figure out where they're at on the globe. Mm -hmm. So we can figure out when our seasons will be. If we end up in the southern hemisphere, of course, our seasons could be opposite. Mm -hmm. you, you, one day you're waiting for spring and the next day you're waiting for the fall. Mm. Yeah. And so the only way you'll be able to tell is if you have a sundial or something like that so that you can recognize where you're at now on the new earth. Well, let's go on. What's left of Egypt emerges from its Mediterranean inundation, new and higher, still the lands of the ages. The commonplace of our times become the mysterious Baalbek of the new era. So this is the new era. This is when we actually go into this new existence. This is what they refer to as the kingdom of heaven. And so you think about how else could it actually happen like that? You have to wipe everything off. All of the kings got to go away. All of the armies got to go away. The police got to go away. Everybody that think they're important got to be brought low. And, you know, the people who think they're unimportant got to be raised high. So we're in this equal playing field with our father as the king. Else, we will create the same mess that we have now where you have third world countries uh, being bombed by first world countries who think they're not important. You have people who's trying to rule over each other, people who's trying to stand in the place of our father, mm -hmm. trying to be God. Mm -hmm. You know, you got all of that stuff going on now. And if it did not play out like this, if we did not have this uh, catastrophic event that 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 humbles the earth, brings us all on an equal playing field, we would actually do it again. Right. Mm hmm. A new era, yes, the cataclysm has done its work well. The greatest population regulator of all does once more for man what he refuses to do for himself and the planet on which he lives and drives the pitiful few who survive into a new stone age. No, pitiful few who survive. So, <laughs> like I say, he's talking from a a a worldly, a worldly scientific standpoint, mm -hmm. not understanding that you know those who don't survive where they're going to end up. Right. A lot of these people don't believe in the afterlife at all, and so for them, it's just over. They've lived the life, they've enjoyed it, and then you know, once they die, then it's just over. They go, you know, there's nothing else, you know. And, and so they're not thinking about the hell that they have to pay on the other side of this thing. So it is those who don't survive that's going to be in a pitiful case. But this right here is the new era. After this cataclysm, after this global earthquake, after this pole shift, we will be in this new era. Like we've said earlier, we will be in the millennial age, the kingdom age, the 1000 year reign of our father. This is when all of that takes place. After this cataclysm, we join Noah, Adam, and Eve, Atlantis, Mu, and Olympus, and our Messiah joins the other gods. By Noah, those that survive will be like the eight people that survived the uh, previous flood, the cat cataclysm, which could have very well been a pole shift. You know, there was a lot of... Uh, similarities between what happened back there during the days of Noah and what's coming up on the world. But there are differences, you know, that we will have to deal with that Noah didn't have to deal with. But the survivors will be like Noah, where, you know, they'll um, basically have to start humanity over. Right. I did a calculation one time and there was several billion, I think 10 billion people around when Noah, when the floods occurred, even more people were alive 
during the days of Noah than they are today. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, you know, so many generations and back then they were having 10 kids at a time Mm -hmm. with none of these uh, diseases of Egypt, you know, killing people and no birth control, you know, Mm -hmm. and all of these other population control things going on. There was more people alive during the days of Noah than there are now, but there was only eight people to survive. And so it'll be like those days. Um, what he's saying is Adam and Eve was a similar event. Um, Adam and Eve would have been several hundred years before Noah. And so what this guy is saying is that there was a similar event. The reason why there was only Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't necessarily believe in that because, you know, scripture doesn't, say scripture doesn't support that at all. It's saying that Adam was the first person created here on the on the earth. Mm-hmm. And so we go with that. But now as far as this Atlantis is concerned, um, there will be cities going away. Right. There will be cities on the water. We'll be talking about, you know, places that, you know, we used to remember Las Vegas. We'll be talking about New York and all kinds of cities mm-hmm. that are now gone and underwater. We'll be talking about those for, you know, hundreds of years, along with the Mu and Olympus and all of that. So this will all be created by this cataclysm. And then it goes on to talk about um, what we think would be the Messiah, but it very well could be talking about this idol God that we've used to replace our Messiah, who would of course go on to be similar to these other false gods or whatever. But our Messiah, our true Messiah, our true master, of course, he'll go to his rightful place, which is our father which is above any of these other fake gods or whatever. He'll go to his to his position as our father and he will reign over the earth unlike has been ever done here since the days of Adam and Eve. Right. But that's it for um this short story that this guy Chan Thomas is talking about. Now he's going to actually start getting into the proofs. And I haven't read any of this other stuff in this book. Mm-hmm. Um what we've read so far has been more like an abstract but i believe he goes into the details here and maybe i'll you know check out the rest of the book and i like i said i'll leave you guys a link to it in the description if y'all want to check it out if you find anything interesting let me know maybe we'll get to do a video on it but i just wanted to share my thoughts on the first part of the book and whether any of it is actually scriptural or not And what we found is, you know, some of it's not, but most of it is. We have the earth, the fire, the wind and the water to deal with. You know, it's just a matter of being prepared. Like we said, we will control the wind through our prayers. The water, the earth is going to take care of that. The earthquake, well, um, that's going to be a short event that, you know, if we survive, we survive. If we don't, you know, we ain't got that to worry about. And then we have the volcanoes and the white hot lava to deal with, too. But we have angelic help for all of this. Mm -hmm. And it'll be up to our father to protect us. We just have to remember the call on him. Yeah, I think one of the um, most important things about everything that's going to happen and, you know, about this video is what you said about we have the protections through the law. And through our love that we have for not just our father, but for each other. That is the only way we can survive. (laughs) Love for our father and love for our neighbor. Doing, um, obeying the law, obeying what the scripture says, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 23. And they making sure we at least have that part. That's the contract that we're under. Exodus chapter 20 through 23 is the contract that we're under, that we're told that if we obey that covenant, that contract, then we will survive. And then having love for our brother, that's, those, are, those are the two things that even our Messiah told us that we have to do in order to survive this. And we're even being told that in the third testament of the Bible, that is the way we will survive. We can't really store up. We can't really plan for anything that's coming. But if we want to survive, then love for our father and love for our brother. And with that, I think we're going to close this video out. If you got anything out of it, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But be sure to leave us a comment either way. And Shalawama. Shalawama. <laughs>